and mocking him. And so when Jesus is going to die, he's going to die weakened and made a mockery of. So then they take the robe off of him. That leads us into verse 21, where it says, A certain man from Siren. This is honestly one of my favorite details in all of the Gospels about Jesus' death. A certain man from Siren, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Divided up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. But this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. So he is mocked by the soldiers, and then they, they lead him out. The reason this is one of my favorite details is because this it, it's kind of weird that they would name a man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander, it, unless the readers knew who Alexander and Rufus are. And we see that in the end of the book of Romans, because when Paul writes a letter to the church that's in Rome, he says, Greet Rufus and his mother. Which is this reminder that, wait, somebody in the scene with Jesus, this Jesus is being executed, and so grabbed out of the crowd is Simon, father of Alexander and Rufus, made to carry the cross because Jesus was too weak to carry his own cross. And somehow, Alexander and Rufus were transformed from bystanders to pillars of the faith in Rome. There's some this, this detail of, oh, Alexander and Rufus. I wanted to name one of our sons Rufus, but Emma said that's a name for dogs. So we don't have a Rufus in our house. Uh, I'm still hoping, I'm still hoping that we have a Rufus one day. But so Rufus and, uh, Rufus and Alexander, their dad, carries the cross with Jesus. It says that they brought Jesus to the place of the skull, which could be a reference to the hill looked like a skull, or because the hill was where they killed, where the Romans killed insurrectionists and criminals. But they offered him, it says when they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, that's, that was kind of like a medicine that would dull the pain, and so Jesus rejects it, as if saying, no, I'm going to drink the cup of God's wrath with nothing else to see. And so Jesus turns down this, this mild painkiller that they offered him, wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. They crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. The soldiers, it was their right to, to the property of the condemned person. And so that's what they did, as they divided up his clothes. And then it was a common thing to take the, the charge that the criminal would wear. This is why he's dying. They would put it on a plaque. He would wear it around his neck on the way to being executed, and then they would take it and they would post it above his head. And so, as far so as far as the Jews are concerned, Jesus is being put to death because he is claimed to be God. But as far as the Romans are concerned, it's because he's going to be a rival king to Caesar. They crucified two rebels with him. Your translation might say two thieves. It was a word that could be an insurrectionist or a thief, but stealing was not a a, uh, a crime that they could put somebody to death for. And so it, we would we understand that the crime that they're guilty of is a crime worthy of death. And so he's crucified with soldiers on his right and on his left. And the people all around are insulting Jesus, including taking the testimony that had been spoken at his trial, the lie that Jesus said he was going to tear down the temple, which Jesus had said, if you tear down the temple of my body, I will raise it in three days. Well, they take it and twist it so they continue to mock him from the cross. And it says in verse 31, in the same way the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he cannot save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. And it says that those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. And so Jesus is crucified 
And then verse, starting in verse 33, this is how Jesus dies. At, at noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of them standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph and Solomon. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. And so here we have Jesus at noon. Darkness comes over the whole land, signifying this the darkest hour in history. And so in the, instead of the middle of the day, the sun shining, it was dark. And that the crowd misunderstood Jesus because he was speaking Aramaic, it sounded kind of like he may have been calling on Elijah. And they have this image in their minds that Elijah would come and rescue the innocent. And that's what's going on when they're like, let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. But notice that when Jesus dies, he doesn't die. He doesn't die the way that they expected. They expected him to suffocate on the cross after three days, because that's what crucifixion does. You eventually get so weak that you can no longer draw a breath, and so he would die in, a, in weakness. And yet, notice in verse 37, it says that with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. As if Jesus is in complete control, giving up his life. Not in, It's not being taken from him. It's not just, well, Jesus finally can't handle it anymore. But Jesus, with a loud cry, showing his complete control in his life and in his death, he breathes his last. Verse 38 speaks of the curtain of the temple, which was a, a curtain dividing the holiest place in the temple from, the, from where the priests are allowed to go. It's a curtain that was 80 feet high, four inches thick, so as wide as my hand today, 80 feet high. And so the detail that it is torn from top to bottom is incredibly important because no person can tear a four inch thick curtain, let alone tear it from 80 feet high all the way down to the bottom. This detail pointing us to the reality of what Jesus' death is going to mean because access to God is no longer mediated by objects or by a temple or by the Jewish religious system. Jesus tears the temple, or sorry, tears the curtain in the temple in his death. And then the centurion, this, this master of death, this was his job, this was what he was good at. The Romans were, it could be incredibly cruel and the Roman soldiers in particular. And so this centurion, that means he's in charge of 100 Roman soldiers, an expert at cruelty, an expert at death. He is the witness standing there and says, this is not a normal death. Surely this man is the son of God. Mark points us to the women who were the witnesses to this, Mary and Mary and Salome. And then we get to the final part of the scene of Jesus' death, verses 42 to 47. It was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. So this is late on Friday. The Sabbath is coming, and the, the Jewish leaders want this death done in advance. They want him buried. So then, so Joseph of Arimathea, who is a member of the council, that has just put Jesus to death. This is, for me, one of my mind-blowing elements of this. Joseph of Arimathea had just been there for Jesus' trial, for Jesus' accusation, and Jesus' condemnation. 
there, and so Joseph of Arimathea was, had to have been silent in that moment. Because Mark tells us it was the whole council that agreed to put Jesus to death. And so Joseph, there we see in the other Gospels, that he didn't consent to Jesus' death, and yet his, he was silent in that moment. But here as evening approaches, Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. That's kind of a strange thing. Only a family member would ask for somebody's body. And so it was a bold thing for Joseph of Arimathea to go and ask for Jesus' body. Because it only takes three days for, the, for a condemned person to die in crucifixion, Pilate was surprised. And so to some critics who say, well, Jesus wasn't really dead. He just fainted on the cross and nobody really knew. It would have taken Jesus, Jesus, what we see is he died. There took, it took enough time for Joseph of Arimathea to leave and go and ask for Jesus' body. Pilate to go, wait, is he dead? Send for the centurion, get word back from the centurion who is a master of death, who knows what death looks like, to say, no, he's really dead. And so we, so there's no real, there's no argument that Jesus just fainted and didn't really die. And so in this story, here we find Jesus dies alone and mocked and cursed, fulfilling scripture and in complete control. What we find here is that Jesus gives up his life and doesn't have it taken from him. And so this passage is like all of this passage is reminding us of what Mark has said already in Mark 10 45 that Jesus, the Son of God, gives his life to ransom people of God. But what is the meaning of Jesus' death? What, is, what did God want? Jesus gives his life to ransom people of God because what God wants is for people to draw near. That's, so if somebody asks you, what is the meaning of Easter? What do Christians believe Easter is about? Christian, or Christians believe, the Bible teaches us, that, that Easter is about God making a way for us to draw near. What I want to show you today, I want to show you these three, three ways that God wants us to draw near from this passage. First, draw near to worship. You see, I, I think that as we look at the soldiers mocking Jesus, doing the exact opposite of what Jesus deserves. That is a clue to us of what Jesus deserves from us. And so that as, as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are working in this moment at purpose, part of the purpose of that is that Jesus get the worship that he, is, that he truly deserves. The soldiers stand there and put a robe on him and put a crown of thorns and make fun of him and they spit on him. They surround him as if he's some kind of rebel and they need 600 soldiers to hold him back. I think that gives us a clue that Jesus is a king that deserves our worship. And so when God calls us to, at, at Easter, when God calls us to himself to draw near, part of what he's calling us to is worship. But the difference is he doesn't pursue it like the world pursues it. We don't know any kings that behave this way. The kings of the world, the leaders of the world, the celebrities of the world who want people to bow down and worship them, they pursue it by saying, look at how great I am. And what we see here is Jesus, the Son of God, giving his life to ransom people to God so that those people become worshipers. You see, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by Satan, Satan says, if you will worship me, if you will bow down, I will give you all of the kingdoms of the world. And what we find here is Jesus, the Son of God, laying down his life for us, so that we will see his worth and worship him. That is what he wants, is he wants worshipers. But he doesn't pursue it like the world does. And so if we have the eyes to see here at Easter, then we can begin to see a king that is far better than any king around. He's far better than any leader, than any celebrity, than anybody in, that we have ever seen in history. Because what king has laid down his life, the innocent for the guilty? John chapter 12 points us to this. John chapter 12, verse, verse 23. Because Jesus says, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Easter is about worship. John chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus says, how is that going to happen? And when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And this is foolishness to the world because the world stands up and says, look at how great I am. Look at what I've accomplished. Look at how much money I have. Look what I can do. Look what I can do for you. And Jesus 
lays down his life for the world because he wants worship. This is a king worthy of worship. And so this Easter week, will you look at the cross and worship? Will you look at this and say, what kind of king would do this? Yes, I want worship. The second way to draw near is that this passage calls us to draw near is draw near to be saved. Verses 31 and 32. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. The priests and the scribes have, in this, have separated being saved from Jesus' death. They said, you, you have saved people, but your death means the end of all of that. And so they are, they are driving a wedge in between man's salvation and Jesus' death. And yet, when we look in the book of Mark, it is calling to us to see that Jesus saves through his dying. And so the world looks at the cross and sees a failure. Well, if we're going to believe in you, you should not die. If, you're going to, if we're going to believe in you to save us, then you, you've, got to, you've got to stay. You've got to set up a kingdom here and now. And yet Jesus saves through his dying. There is no other salvation than this one. Not church attendance. Not good behavior. Not giving to good causes. Not, not being a little bit better than our neighbor or our enemy. There is no other salvation. And so draw near to this Jesus who saves in his dying. You see, I, I think that the leaders are saying God could never use this. God could never use this. Like, look at the shame of Jesus on the cross. God could never use this. And yet the gospel says this is precisely how God works. It's through his death. So maybe you're here today and you say, wait, how, Joe, how can I draw near to be saved? Because with all I think about when I think about drawing near to God is the things that I've said and done that keep me from God. All the things that make me know that I am guilty. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, why is that so important? Because way back at the beginning, God created people to live in a relationship to him and to love him. To, to follow and obey his one rule. But Adam and Eve, and everybody after them, have said, no, we will not live your way. We will not worship you, we will not glorify you. We will set up our own kingdoms. The Bible calls that sin. It says the, the, the penalty of sin is death. Physical life, death in this life, and an eternal death in hell forever. But here in the gospel, we see the God-man, Jesus Christ, who lived the way we should have lived, dying the death that we should die. And he's going to be raised to life so that all who forsake any other salvation and any other way to be right with God can know that God accepts and loves and saves them in Jesus Christ. If you have questions about that, grab me at the end of this service. Because this is too important. We don't want to just say, well, draw near to worship, do your best. We don't want to just say, draw near to be a better moral person. We'll be Draw near to be saved. Give up on any other salvation and take the Son of God who uses his death to save the world. And so this passage tells us what we need for salvation. We need somebody to die in our place, and we have it. So we don't have to carry our guilt around, trying to outdo and outrun what we've once done, trying to outdo and outrun the temptation that we feel moment by moment, trying to outrun the guilt that we deal with. Mark calls to us in the gospel here at Jesus on the cross and says, draw near to be saved and you can be saved. The third way that this calls us to draw near, it says draw near no matter who you are or where you're from. Draw near no matter who you are or where you're from. Verses 38 and 39 I think are really the center of the this section of the book of Mark. The points that they're telling us this, this detail that until we realized it was 80 feet tall and 4 inches thick, we don't realize how important the curtain of the temple was to. But the curtain
curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, reminding us that God is saying, you are no longer coming to me this way. You're no longer being separated from me in this way. Tearing up the old way of approaching God or being separate from God. The book of Hebrews specifically refers to the access to God being made new in Christ. But that verse, 38, about the curtain in the temple, is followed up with 39. That it talks about the centurion. It wasn't, it wasn't a priest. It wasn't one of his disciples. It wasn't a holy man. It wasn't a rich man. It was the centurion who looks at Jesus right after the curtain has been torn in two. He is the one who says, surely this man was the Son of God. I think that this is important. And there's a quote by N.G. Wright where he comments on what this means. And now at last, it's not the high priest. It's not a leading rabbi, not even a loyal disciple, but a battle-hardened thug in Roman uniform, used to killing humans the way one might kill flies. He stands before this dying young Jew and says something which in Mark's mind sends a signal to the whole world that the kingdom has indeed come. That a new age is being born that God has done something, the news of which will spread around the globe. The Roman centurion becomes the first sane human being in Mark's gospel to call Jesus God's son and he mean it. Yes, says Mark to his possibly Roman audience, and if you, why not more? You see, the first person who bears witness to who Jesus is and what Jesus does from the cross is not somebody who's righteous, not somebody who's been there from the beginning, not somebody who's seen all the miracles, but it is a Roman soldier, the most disqualified person, the person standing there and putting Jesus to death, which I think is this reminder to you and I that it doesn't matter who you are or where you're from, you are welcome to draw near. Roman soldiers, people like you and me, all of us, the, the, the curtain is torn in two, and a Roman soldier who's not even from there, who doesn't even have the right religion, and who has the blood of hundreds, if not thousands, on his hands, is standing there, and the door is flung wide open to people like the Roman centurion. And so if a Roman centurion, who is in the middle of putting Jesus to death, is welcome, then you are welcome. Your family is welcome. Your neighbors are welcome. Uh, everyone in our county or our counties is welcome. And so this passage, talking through the death of Jesus, telling us what does the death of Jesus mean? It means come close to God. Not with the old way of the Old Testament. Not with the old way of the Jewish religion. But in the body and blood of Jesus. And so I think this passage tells us to stop messing around with morals and with religion and with self-improvement. It says, stop being satisfied with the world and come here to God in the person of Jesus Christ. No matter who you are or where you're from, you are welcome to draw near. No matter what this last week looked like, no matter what this morning looked like, no matter what this next week looks like, it is a, what does God want in our lives moment by moment? He, he wants people who draw near. I want you to imagine, maybe you're a child and you're here and you go, so what does God want from me, moment by moment? Is it for me to just be nice at school, to be nice with my siblings, to obey my parents? I know, this story tells us, four-year-old, five-year-old, ten-year-old, twelve-year-old, draw near to God. He wants you. He wants you, just like you are, just where you are. Come here. Imagine what changes when you know moment by moment, whether you're riding on the bus, whether you're at school, whether you're playing at home, playing on your block, whether you're at church, that God wants me right now near Him. Imagine maybe, maybe you're an adult and you think of all the ways that you have been unwanted in your life. And you think of all the people that pushed you away, maybe a family member. <gasps> It could be a spouse. Maybe it's your kids or your grandkids. People have pushed you away and said, no, I don't, you've done something or so I don't want to need you. Imagine what changes when the dominant story of your life is that the God of the universe wants me to join you. Imagine what changes in a family 
I mean, no matter what happens with the medical bills, no matter what happens with difficulty in this life, the dominant story in your family is that the God of the universe loves us, gave himself for us, and wants us to draw near him. Imagine what happens in the life of the church when the defining factor in the church is not the programs that we run, the numbers that we have, the budgets that we have, the, the difference that we make. It's that the God of the universe gave himself for us. And he loves us, and week after week, and day after day, he wants us to draw near. He wants everybody to draw near. That is a good news kind of church. Let's pray. Father, as we gaze on the cross, and we're reminded one more time that you, the God of the universe, did not come to be served, but to serve, and give your life as a ransom for him. You gave your life as a ransom for us. We pray that that would sink down deep and be the dominant story in our hearts. We pray that that would sink down deep and spread wide in our town, in our county, in our region. So that people would know the God of the universe loves them and faith himself.